to the Lazelle Wellbeing Show and this very special episode celebrating and marking World Menopause Day. Now I am going to be joined by the outspoken and sometimes controversial obstetrician and gynaecologist and international best-selling author of the Vagina Bible, Dr Jen Gunter. She is a fierce advocate for women's health, as you will tell, and her latest book is called The Menopause Manifesto and Dr Dr. Jen is countering some of the more stubborn myths and misunderstandings about menopause with her own insight. Now, we've just had a fascinating conversation covering some of these common misunderstandings, including how our ethnicity may or may not influence our menopause, whether the age of our first period affects when we reach menopause, and whether eating any foods rich in phytoestrogens can have any impact at all on our symptoms. She's very vocal on lots of things, including unregulated, dangerous bioidentical hormones and the efficacy or perhaps lack of using certain herbs. Now, we don't agree on all things, but it is certainly a very timely chat. And don't forget that if you would like to watch our chat today, the video podcast is available on YouTube. And as always, I'm very much looking forward to hearing your thoughts on Instagram after the show. And so without further ado, let's hear from Dr. Gunter. So, Dr. Gunter, it's a very warm welcome. This is a special time to be talking to you, and thank you for getting up at literally crack of dawn stateside to join us. We're so appreciative. Oh, my pleasure, my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. No, it's great. I mean, it's it's so good to talk about all things nether regions. I mean, your first book, The Vagina Bible, was just such a big revelation, I think, for so many. It was really one of the first that, you know, dared to use the V word, wasn't it? Yeah, it's it's really amazing to me how many books just use euphemisms on the cover. And uh, so it it seemed that that itself was sort of an act of, you know, speaking out, just having the title. It's crazy, isn't it? You know, it's like when you when you look up, you know, vagina or vulva on on the Internet, you know, in images, you just get porn. I mean, it's very hard to get some proper health information. Yeah. And articles that are trying to give you health information are calling it like your hoo-ha or down there or your V spot. And, you know, I mean, we're not infants. Like, in fact, you should just use the correct term regardless of the age. Uh, But yeah, it's, it's very infantilizing. Yeah, indeed. Well, obviously, menopause is is not infantilizing. I mean, it's it, it's a, a a luxury, I think, now in these days that women are living old enough to be experiencing probably more decades without periods than with them, as we grow older and and healthier. What really prompted you to write the menopause manifesto? And I have to say, it's an absolutely brilliant read. You you are just so bold with it. I love it. Well, so I was on tour for the Vagina Bible, and I had already signed a deal for another book, so something had to come out. Sure. And um, and so I was, you know, trying to think, of what am I going to write about? And I had thought a bit about menopause. I was really toying with it, but I had a couple of other ideas too. But on book tour, there was question after question about menopause, and it was really interesting. They weren't the first questions at all, but once one woman asked a question, mm-hmm. then the floodgates opened. And yeah. then I realized after a couple of cities of this, because this was back in the day when, when we did in-person book tours, uh, <laughs> I I just thought, okay, there's something here. And people were just so desperate for anything. And uh, it seemed that creating a safe space to talk about the vulva and vagina created a safe space to talk about what apparently was the last taboo in an aging yeah. woman's body. Yeah, absolutely. And during that time, what were the key myths and misunderstandings that you came across? Well, you know, people thinking either menopausal hormone therapy was completely dangerous or it was absolutely risk-free, like like completely like like oxygen, you know, type of thing. Mm. And mm. Uh, so really these extremes um, of views, and I'll be clear, menopausal hormone therapy is actually a very safe therapy, but the idea that a therapy is basically completely risk-free is, I mean, Tylenol is not risk-free, right? So yeah, sure. um, getting out of bed is not risk-free. Right, exactly. It was sort of like this either demonized or put on a pedestal. 
you know, as opposed yeah. to like, hey, this is just a therapy, right? Like, why are we worshiping a treatment? Like, this is just a treatment. And uh, and just this lack of information about anything non-hormonal. Like, like really, like, you know, okay, hormones can help some people in menopause, absolutely. But, but you know, the healthiest things people can do in menopause are nothing to do with a prescription. So mm-hmm. it really, mm-hmm. you know, it just seemed that women had no idea why we had menopause, why, you know, what was happening to their bodies, but also, yeah. you know, they were inundated with, you know, people selling products and misinformation sure. about hormones. And so I just thought, you know, menopause needs a reboot. Mm. Interesting. In America, you, you you talk about MHT, menopausal mm-hmm. hormone therapy. In the UK, we very much talk about HRT, mm-hmm. hormone replacement therapy. And, and you write in the book, the differentiation between the two that, you know, replacing hormones kind of suggests that it's a disease rather than menopausal hormone therapy being the hormones that we need to continue to function healthily. Yeah. So there's a big movement here to do that. And I I hope it takes over, you know, this idea that, and I, that, that menopause is a disease is incorrect. This idea Mm. that menopause is a state of hormone deficiency is incorrect. Otherwise, being a child is a state of hormone deficiency. Right. You were never meant to have estrogen when you were five, and you're not meant to have it when you're 60. It's, and it's sort of, it is really important to get away from that because this also starts to then impose good and bad with estrogen, right? Mm. This sort of, you know, which is then, you know, oh, you're only feminine with it or you're only valuable with it. And, you know, we evolved to not have estrogen in our 60s. We evolved to have menopause. And so it's not a state of hormone deficiency. You know, it's not like a you know, having a low thyroid, for example, my son has congenital hypothyroidism. He has mm. a thyroid deficiency and he needs to be on thyroid replacement and he's been on it since birth. So mm. that's not what menopause is. And I always get people to think about, would you say that same thing about a child? And if you yeah. wouldn't, then that language should be changed because it changes how we view things. And for so long, you know, we've been sort of taught that there is no value after menopause and is all tied in with this complicated, awful language. And we need to get away from that. But wouldn't you say, though, that we're not actually probably evolved to live much beyond our 60s? You know, we're we're designed to be procreating and, and producing the next generation and carrying on the species. And then you know, it's kind of job done as women and and shuffle off. But now we are living longer. And isn't it clearly helpful to be living with our hormones than living without them as women? No, it's actually not. So we evolved to, you know, the life expectancy is about to the age of 65, actually. So there's this Mm. whole sort of misunderstanding thinking that all women died around the age of 50. No one ever thinks all men died around the age of 50. Like, what's up with that? But so, no, there's all this information from the grandmother hypothesis that tells us that we evolved actually to probably not have met, not have, uh, not to continue ovulating because that helps the next species. So if you look at other animals, they all die uh, immediately after they finish reproducing and human Mm. keep living. And what that does is that helps the next generation to have more children. So it's evolution, the long game. And if you look at, for example, work from the 1980s done by Dr. Kristen Hawks, looking at the Hosda women, you know, again, their life expectancy is the mid sixties. And up until then, you know, they're spending 37 hours a week foraging for food. They're not like inactive and frail. So can hormones help many women? Yes. Are they necessary for all women? No, they're not. And so Mm -hmm. I think you have to look at what is the reason they're being prescribed? What is the Mm -hmm. benefit from it? And, um, and then to work from there, just like any other therapy. Yeah. And I know in, in the UK, there's been this real confusion over kind of compounded by bi- so-called bioidentical hormones, which are unregulated. Um, and then the regulated kind. What's currently being used in the States? What, what's the situation with you guys? Well, unfortunately, about 40 to 50% of people are using the unregulated hormones. And I have that to say- many? Yeah. And I have to say, anybody listening, if you're one of them, you're not getting good medical advice. That's sure. really, as it's as black and white as that. It's as, mm-hmm. you know, I think it's really important for people to understand that, that they are being sold- misinformation, they're getting untested products. And I think it's a really important point because 
we have an awful history in medicine of women being subjected to untested or under-tested therapies, right? We had thalidomide. We had diethylstilbestrol. We had the Dalcon shield. Um, we had problems with mesh. And so all these people, you know, doctors rushing to give untested compounded therapies are just continuing that lineage of harm to women. That's a really strong statement. And of course, in the UK, they tend to be prescribed only by very expensive private clinics. So there does tend to be an element of profiteering and preying on vulnerable women who mm -hmm. perhaps don't have sympathetic national health service doctors, which we have over here, who can prescribe these things that are regulated and are, and are so much cheaper and, and, as you say, safer. Absolutely. I would never trust my health to a compounded hormone preparation. The data, you know, the, the scant data that we have is actually very concerning. Mm -hmm. You know, there's hormone pellets, which give incredibly high levels that are associated with a much higher incidence of complications. And all of the other compounded stuff are probably actually leaving people at risk and they're not getting enough hormone in their bloodstream. But, you know, that's just from the scant, scant data. I always say yeah. to people, what are you hiding? These therapies are untested. Things are yeah. untested for a reason. You know, pharmaceutical companies want to prove their stuff works because they want to make money from it. And they have a regulatory process so they don't end up taking advantage of people. And certainly in the United States, and I don't know the ins and outs of the laws in the UK, but these these compounded products are not regulated by the FDA. So, but you know, the language on the website's confusing. You can understand how people, yeah. you know, some of the websites lie. They say they're approved by the Food and Drug Administration and they're not. So, so the average person doesn't stand a chance. And then another mm -hmm. thing I'd like to add is these companies are very good at search engine optimization. So if you wow. look up you know, compounded hormones, you're going to get site after site after site that tells you great things. So what they do is they send press release after press release to, you know, whatever, thousands of news sites. Yeah, I've maybe, seen it. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Maybe because you'll see three or four similar stories pop up all at once. And it's a slow news day, whatever, at the mail online or whatever. And so someone just takes that news release and just basically writes it into an article. And now a valid site has written about it. So when Google trawls through, those things come to the top because they're they're considered valid news sites. And I know it's the mail, so you know we can argue about valid, but but you get what I mean. It's it's something that's yeah. been registered, you know, as that, not somebody's like blog. So so then what happens is, and then all the doctors who who uh, who promote this stuff, all their websites are considered legitimate by Google as well. So so somebody like me writing about the dangers of it, it just gets pushed to the bottom. So people yeah. have very little hope of finding that information. Mm. And on the subject of valid information and the spread of misinformation, of course, we have to touch on the Women's Health Initiative and the misrepresentation of, of, of safety data there. I mean, that was just so crippling overnight for, for millions of women globally. As, as an American, how, how, how is that perceived now? Is the word getting out there that that, that was wrong, wrongly published data? I'm, you know, yes and no. I mean, it's like everything, you know, the, the misinformation is published on the first page and the retractions on page 10. Right. And right. we're all primed to believe the first piece of information that we get. We all are. I mean, this is why we've had so much trouble in the pandemic with people changing. Mm. This concept that science changes is very hard for people. You know, we went from right. masks don't help to everybody needs masks. And people still have trouble with that despite all of mm. the information because at one point we said we didn't. Right. Mm -hmm, and so mm -hmm. people view that change of mind as uncertainty, which yeah. then makes it even harder for people to make a medical decision. So yeah. you have the incorrect information and then sometimes the correction just reinforces it. So, yeah. so yeah, it was, it was problematic in a lot of ways also provided some very useful data too. Uh, but unfortunately the way it was communicated to the public and to physicians was really very inappropriate. And I cover that in detail in the book. And, yeah, and we've been left, you know, kind of picking up the pieces. And then, you know, there's a lot of domino effect. Many studies, you know, in Europe were stopped because of the WHI, because yeah. it was a randomized, double-blinded, placebo-controlled trial. It was the highest quality data. So, you know, it really, it really shook people. But, you know, I think that we have completely, certainly recovered medically, but it's really hard to get the echoes out. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, there's a lot of campaigners, you know, trying there and and, and doing, you know, really well with it. I think one of the common misconceptions, and, and, and you cover this in your book, is that I think women in their 40s are not prepared. We, we, we don't really talk about perimenopausal. Uh, certainly here in the UK, this is a, a very newish term. And even as a health writer, I've been writing health and well-being for 35 years. It was a new one for me. And I didn't even hear it until I was in my 50s. By then it was too late. I wish I'd heard it in, in my 40s. What's, what are your key messages there surrounding perimenopause? Yeah, so just like it took five, six, seven years to go from being a child to an adult, maybe longer, depending on the length of your puberty. That's the same thing that you should think about when you're going from being, uh, you know, in what we call the reproductive years to being postmenopausal, that you have this time of hormonal chaos where things are starting and stopping, just like with puberty. And mm. just like with puberty, you know, some of the side effects can be problematic, but they're not going to be there forever, right? Like, yeah. you know, the puberty acne, the puberty mood swings, all those things that we, you know, might think back and remember, you didn't have those forever, right? And so it's the same thing. And so the menopause transition, uh, which can also be called the perimenopause or premenopause is, is that time. And it is really unfortunate that it's not discussed because I think that leads a lot of people down the path of um, menopause is a disease. Why is this awful mm -hmm. thing happening to me? If I, why should I be bleeding this heavily, it must be a problem. But nobody looks at puberty as a disease, right? Yeah. And so yeah. that's what the lack of information does. And I, I think it gets back to at a core that we are, if you read a news article in most magazines for a woman in her early 40s, it's geared towards her fertility. It's geared towards, oh, have you been pregnant yet? Are you, you know, it's all geared towards infertility, egg freezing, all this kind of stuff. It's not geared towards perimenopause because when you think about menopause in most popular press, it's viewed as a pre-death. And who wants to write about that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're seeing now, I think, more celebrities certainly here in the UK becoming more open and more willing to talk about it. But I, you know, I, I've spoken to many, you know, A-listers who say it's the kiss of death. I mean, you simply do not want to admit to being menopausal or, you know, you, you're just seen as somehow decrepit and past it. Mm -hmm. And is, is that stigma changing in the States? No. <laughs> really? I mean, I think it's, you know, sure, it's gradually changing. But, you know, I think the Western society is especially very ageist and mm -hmm. it's much more ageist for women, right? Like you can yeah. have a 60 year old male action star and no one thinks twice about it. Yeah. But you, a 60 year old female action star, what? You know, um, I think that, you know, for example, seeing um, Judy Dench as, as M, right? Like that was. Fabulous. Exactly. That was like mm. a breakthrough. And she wasn't, you know, made up to look like she was 42. You know, she <laughs> looked age appropriate and yeah. she looked amazing. And she was, you could absolutely believe her as, as like this yeah. incredibly brilliant sort of head of, of the agency or, you know, M, you know, yeah. M, with M, the experience and exactly, the wisdom, exactly. which you need. Yeah. So, so I think that it's changing slowly, but you know, if you look again, like I, I often use, you know, just many women's magazines as a, bar as a barometer and, you know, the, the language, if menopause is discussed, it is only discussed in negative terms. And why then do people want to talk about it? If we want to change society, we also have to insist that everybody talks about it differently and not talks about it in pejorative terms. And it's, it's a phase of life. And, you know, that this is, that we had such incredible worth. We have all this anthropological data that, that, you know, we need, we need to flip the script and, you know, instead of talking about it as being a pre-death, we have to say, look, women in menopause drove evolution. Women in menopause gave us everything we had, you know, it's, it, it's, it's such an important part of our development as a species. So how then do we start to switch this narrative into a more positive shift for older women? Well, I think first of all, you know, getting away from any language that uses that disease model, you know, that, that if you, if you're talking about menopause as a disease, you know, a disease is a devil word, right? So if you think about rhetoric, right, that's God word, God words are God terms and devil terms. And with a God word, you fill in the blank positive. So that's what the wellness industry has done, use rhetoric to their, their benefit. You know, they use words like 
pure, clean, and natural. Those are God words, which are interestingly also the same words of purity culture. I always think that's an interesting observation. And what do we have in medicine? We have disease, we have, you know, illness, we have, you know, things that are devil words. And so yeah, pain med- and decay. Exactly. And death and, yeah. And so we need to be very mindful of the language that we're using and of, you know, of how we're presenting you know, how, how we're insisting menopause be presented, you know, with accuracy Mm. and facts and agency. Um, and, uh, but you know, I mean, it's, it's an uphill battle. I don't, I've, I absolutely believe it's winnable, but it's all again, a fallout of purity culture because it, you know, if you're prized for being basically a 20 year old breeder virgin, you know, right. Then, then once you're, thir- once you're 35, you, what's your value to that society? So I think that we can all also though, make a difference by not going to movies where, you know what, there's a 60 year old male actor partnered with a 32 year old. Like yeah. you could say, I don't, I don't want to spend my money on that. I want to spend my yeah. money on things that reflect the values that I want to see. Yeah. And I think it's also the conversation, isn't it? And the language, which I know that you're, you're very hot on, I remember speaking to a professor of, of obstetrics saying, you know, it was a bit like pregnancy in the old days. Nobody said the word. You yes. wouldn't say the word pregnancy. You wouldn't say the word breastfeeding. He said, now everybody every day should be saying the word menopause five times a day. And it just normalizes that in language. And it's just like you, you would say, I don't know, you know, woman or, you know, driving or something. I mean, it's just a normal mm-hmm. term. And it, it's, it doesn't have that pejorative connotation of, of, of negativity that perhaps has been associated with it. No, I absolutely agree. When you don't say a word, you give it a power that it doesn't deserve, you know, mm. like, like menopause, you know, is just, a, it's just part of biology. It's nothing else. It's no more, it's just like puberty, right? No one is like, Ooh, sure. I can't say the word puberty. I can't say the word teen, <laughs> you know? So, so yeah. So yeah, I remember my, my eldest daughter, she has four younger siblings and you know, threatening to throw my my younger children puberty parties, which oh. apparently is a thing. <laughs> She's saying, "Oh, look at you! Your voice is breaking. Should we throw you a puberty party?" And they'd all get, you know, very embarrassed. Uh. Yeah, I mean, maybe we should be having menopause celebrations, menopause parties. <laughs> well, I think I think we should should be. I actually think we should be changing the name. I don't think it should be called menopause anyway. But what would um, you change it to? Um, climacteric, which is okay. an older term that was used, and in some in some uh, languages, that's actually the term that's still used. And the reason for it is, is it's um, in sort of older medical terms, like from the 16, 1700s, 1800s, both women and men had climacteric. It's just phases of really? life. Yeah. It's just that climacteric is really phase of life. That's it. But it also has another term in, um, in biology, I guess, uh, plant biology, where it refers to ripe fruit. And I like that idea that, you know, I that, like you that, know, that we finally ripen. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and, um, and in Eastern medicine, they also have phases of life. Now they were, they were in seven year blocks for women and eight year blocks for men, but still it also then honors both an Eastern and Western tradition. So I think climacteric is, and it was a term that used to be used fairly commonly until about the fifties. So I think we should be going back to climacteric because I just think it's, you know, menopause it's, it's so not about your final menstrual period, right? Like that's only a very small part of it. And it does sound silly to be 70 and to be sort of defining your life in relation to your last menstrual period. That way, yeah, which could have been a couple of decades right, ago easily. Exactly. You know, we don't define men as to whether or not they have erectile dysfunction. You know, oh, you're in a rectopause, are you? We should start doing that. <laughs> I personally think we should start doing that until the language gets changed. And then they can see okay. how they feel. I think that's brilliant. I mean, the other thing that I was interested to read in your book um, was the SWAN study, Mm -hmm. when you talk about how menopause affects women of different ethnicities differently. And that's something that we don't often think about here or don't really talk about much in the UK. Can you explain these findings? Well, a lot of the stuff from the SWAN study actually shows that um, what we used to believe was incorrect. So there used to be ideas that people of, you know, different races might have menopause at different ages. But, you know, that also really is part of a really, I think, a racist legacy saying that, you know, we're 
you know, we have these huge differences biologically when we really don't. We're all really very, very similar. Um, and so actually the age of menopause is pretty, pretty stable, is certainly in the United States across, you know, all races, cultural backgrounds. Certainly poverty has a huge impact and that's obviously impacted a lot of data on race, right? So um, people who are, have lower socioeconomic statuses, people who um, are, are less able to, um, to complete their education are actually more likely to have an earlier menopause. People who right. are um, subject to more adverse childhood experiences, for example, child abuse, neglect, um, incarcerated parents, um, food insecurity, um, there's actually some data to show that could even affect menopause and probably from the perpetual sort of triggering of, you know, the stress response, right? The toxic stress response, because that affects how your brain is wired and everything happens in your brain. That's really interesting. Yeah. So th things like the production of cortisol in youth mm -hmm. as, as a stress response could exactly. potentially influence or, or, or bring on a menopause earlier. Yeah, there's some data. So the the um, the yeah, there's definitely data on that. There's also data to show that. Uh, which is stronger data to show that people have more symptoms related to having adverse childhood experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, and there is definitely some data from SWAN that shows that hormone levels may be different. Um, you know, that for example, um, African-American women are more likely to have one hormone profile versus uh, Caucasian women or, or white women or, or Asian women. But you also have to understand that, um, that, that we don't really know what to do with that data yet. And it, it may mean a lot. It may mean nothing. And so, you know, I always tell people, this is just, we just need to learn more. Uh, but I think it's really interesting that when you look around the world and you can play, compare cultures that have sort of similar socioeconomic statuses, the age of menopause is pretty, st is stable. So that tells us it's been stable for a long time, you know, that it's mm -hmm. so similar in much different, many different regions around the world. Does the age of a woman's first menstrual period have any bearing on her age of menopause? No, typically not. It's one of those things people are like, oh, if I start early, I'm going to finish early. And, and no, <laughs> um, because there are completely different biological processes. The things that trigger your first menstrual period are exactly not any way related to the thing that, you know, trigger your last period. Uh, really? it, with, there's one minor exception that if your period starts super late, after the age of 16, then uh, in general, met the average age of menopause is like 53 versus 52. So, you know, right. you, you might delay it one year, but, but yeah, no, so, it, so it's not reflection. Mm. And what about the risk of things like heart disease after menopause? You know, what, what, what's your take on that? You know, why, why would that increase so much? Well, so, um, so with the earlier menopause, definitely the higher the risk of heart disease. We see that. And with later menopause, the um, higher the risk of breast cancer. So, it, you know, but heart, because heart disease is the number one killer of women, by yeah. and large, um, and, and also early menopause is linked with osteoporosis. So earlier menopause is on balance worse. Uh, from a health perspective. Right. So, um, yeah, so I, the, you know, it's, it's really this, um, it's really knowing your risk and knowing if, so mm. if you know that, okay, I'm 45 and I go through menopause, then I might need to be a little bit more mindful about my heart health than my friend who's 53. Just like if you have a family history, you might need to be more mindful or, mm. you know, if you have a diet that's high in saturated fat. So knowing your risk factors allows you to sort of, you know, um, maybe, Maybe that might spur you to quit smoking, for example, right? right. You know, yeah. um, and so, and the reasons are really complex. And so what's happening is women are catching up with men, right? So men have a higher incidence of heart disease. And with menopause, women start to lose the advantage of, of estrogen and sort of be, you know, all of that that it entails. Uh, mm -hmm. And a lot of it's related to the change in muscle mass and um, putting on what's called visceral fat around your organs, which is inflammatory. And, but there may also be direct effect of estrogen on the blood vessels and others. So it's very complex. And I think it's also mm -hmm. important for people to remember that there's other hormonal changes happening as well. Um, and that we're starting to learn more about these hormones that they may actually be drivers as well. So for example, with osteoporosis, it's not just about low estrogen. When you're in menopause, there's also a high level of the hormone FSH or follicle stimulating hormone. And there's some data to show that's also a driver of osteoporosis. So some of these things might explain, you know, some of us have higher levels of FSH in menopause versus others. And so that might explain or help explain risk factors for some. 
Mm. How do you advise your parent, your your patients rather, um, in terms of osteoporosis? Because it is such a, a hidden, silent, and yet massive killer of women. Yeah. So this is something that I th- I find is really um, is really problematic, and I think it gets back again to this idea that women get frail as they age, and that's accepted. Right. So if it's accepted to have your little old granny and, you know, oh, she's really frail, you have to be careful about grandma, then no one thinks it's problematic when she starts having fractures. They think that's normal and it's not normal. So, you know, so it's really important that that people get screened for osteoporosis uh, at, you know, an appropriate time for them. So if you're otherwise healthy in general at 65, but if you have risk factors, it may be earlier. And depending on your family risk factors, if you've had a fracture before. So for example, there's even a new study that came out that if you've had a fracture for any reason, um, you know, even breaking a bone from, you know, when you were 20, because you were playing, you know, soccer, right, or football, Mm -hmm. then, um, then that, also increases your risk because you know what? Not everybody who falls breaks a bone, right? So maybe there's something different. So all of these things. Um, and so it's just really important. I think this is one area that unfortunately women have to really advocate for themselves uh, mm. because I see a lot of people that are diagnosed late with osteoporosis. And I think an, a really other sort of important corollary is to make sure that you're doing everything that you can, which is weight-bearing exercise throughout your whole life yes. and making sure that you have until, you know, the age of 50 or so, 1,000 milligrams of calcium a day and then after 50, you know, 1,200 and that you have adequate vitamin D because you need a vitamin D to absorb calcium. And again, mm-hmm. you have to remember, you know, people say, oh, well, you know, menopause, ha-, people say, oh, well, osteoporosis, for example, is evidence that menopause is a disease. And it's like, well, no. I mean, if you get back to our ancestral grandmothers, they would have been spending 37 hours a week foraging for food. They would have been doing way more weight-bearing exercise than we do. That would have protected their bones. They would have been exposed to the sun much more than we would have been because they, you know, they didn't have the kind of shelter that we had and clothing. So their vitamin D levels would probably have been higher, right? So, Mm. you know, I mean, I'm not saying it was all peachy keen, you know, (laughs) <laughs> thousands and thousands of no. years ago. But, you know, we've also changed our lifestyle in many ways that actually could increase our risk of osteoporosis. Yeah, absolutely. And what about food and diet? You know, do you, I mean, I, I know that you write a lot about that, but do you have views on obtaining things like phytoestrogens from food? I mean, there's no data that phytoestrogens make any difference. Um, no. You know, so, and it, if you look at, you know, how we consume diets around the world. So for example, in Japan, they have diets, traditional traditional Japanese diets are very high in phytoestrogens and mm. they live a very long, healthy life in general. But if you go to the Mediterranean diet, if you go to you know Greece or Southern Italy, they have almost no phytoestrogens in their food and they also live a very long, healthy <laughs> life, right? So, yeah. you know, so it's, so it doesn't make sense that phytoestrogens would be some magical key because they're not native all over the world. And they, again, we don't see these populations that are, you know, now, if, if only people who lived where phytoestrogens live you grow, grew well historically, lived longer, then that would be different. But what you see is similarities between these cultures is they eat a ton of vegetables and they eat a lot of fatty fish and they yeah. don't eat a lot of ultra processed food. You know, so they, there's other sure. things in their diets that are very healthy. So this idea that phytoestrogens can help really gets back to this quick fix. And, you know, phytoestrogens aren't absorbed well. And, yeah. um, and many of us, you know, probably don't have the right gut bacteria to absorb it anyway. And so humans are very creative omnivores. And I think that's something that's often missed in discussions about diets. That's why we've been so successful in such diverse, you know, um, culture, you know, places around the world. I mean, that's really true. You know, mm. think about, you know, all the amazing different foods from all these cultures that you try. I mean, I, you know, obviously I haven't tried every culture's food, but there's every yeah. time I have something new from, you know, something I'd never heard of before. I'm like, oh my gosh, how creative are humans? I can't believe you use this. And so people would come up with very healthy diets, you know, to survive wherever they survived. And, you know, the diets that weren't healthy, those people would die out, right? So, you know, evolution kind of has your back there. So the healthiest diet for menopause is the healthiest diet. So it's low low in saturated fat, high in vegetables. Legumes are a great source because they are, you know, low, they're low fat, no fat sources of fiber and protein and, um, and fat, you know, a couple of servings of fatty fish a week. Uh, and, um, yeah. Yeah, and lots of eggs, my own personal favorite. Oh, I, I love eggs. They're powerhouses, yeah. man. They pack everything in. 
everything it's just such the perfect convenience food isn't it do you have any favorite supplements or, or herbs is there anything that that does find favor with your research no they're all pretty much a scam no. <laughs> yeah um and it, it's really not much different than our bioidentical hormone sort of compounded right. hormone discussion you know these products are largely untested and if you're thinking something is going to help you, help you with a symptom, that means it's having a pharmaceutical effect. Would you take an untested antidepressant? No, yeah. <laughs> most people wouldn't. Would you take, you know, an untested blood pressure medication? Most people would be like, why would you give me that? So, you know, there's really very little data to support um, to support the majority of sort of supplements that are recommend that are pushed. Um, yeah. There's one and actually, when when you take into account the placebo effect, which can be as yes. high as sixty percent, can't it? In some studies, exactly. And again, these the studies are almost all incredibly low quality. So we spend all this time gnashing our teeth about the WHI, which certainly had issues, but it was a high quality study. And here mm. people are willing to accept a, you know, a low quality study. And you're like, wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense. Why are you so wrapped yeah. up with the WHI if you're willing to accept, you know, a, ca a case series of six patients, right? Like yeah, it just sure. makes no sense at all. So, you know, I think we, we all seem to love our supplements. And again, it gets back to that's probably a God word. And, um, you know, mm -hmm. it's very culturally, I think in a lot of cultures, um, something people like to do. Uh, and so I think it's just important people realize that they're taking something that's untested and, mm -hmm. um, and the, you know, supplements are the, the leading cause of medication related liver failure. So, wow. yeah, that's very sobering. you know, yeah. I mean, and I talk about, you know, black cohosh is one that's been pushed and it, it's a really good example of everything that's wrong with the supplement industry. So, you know, black cohosh is often advertised to people that it was used by, you know, indigenous people for menopause and it wasn't. Um, so really, yeah, it wasn't, it's just, you know, that, you know, that's a, a appealing to an ancient culture or appealing to another culture is a very common wellness marketing term, right? So marketing strategy. So it wasn't. Secondly, um, there's almost no studies that show it helps. There are definitely reports of liver failure associated with it. And so you've got all this, you know, low quality data that shows it doesn't really work. Um, and you have people having, you know, reports of liver failure. So somebody decided to study it. And what they did was they took a whole bunch of black cohosh supplements that were, you know, on the shelf in the U.S. and they tested them. And 25% uh, didn't contain any black cohosh at all. No so way. what how, What would you think if every single time you um, opened a tin of chickpeas, uh, garbanzo beans, if there was a 25% chance they could be kidney beans? You'd be pretty yeah. angry, right? If you're making yeah. a recipe, you open it up and it's kidney beans and you need garbanzo beans, right? Or if 25% of the time you open the milk, it was orange juice, you would be angry. You'd be down at, isn't it Weight Rose, the store? You'd be like, you'd yep, be down yep, at Weight Rose going, what is going on here? 25% yeah. of the time, no consumer would accept that. But that's what people are accepting with mm. these herbal so-called therapies. And I think that's just, so, and what they, you know, what was in, what was the 25%? What did it contain? So the people who mm. were doing the study thought, okay, well, maybe because black cohosh is native to North America. It doesn't grow anywhere else. So the black cohosh had to have been gathered in North America, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe they thought, okay, well, maybe when people are gathering it, they're mistaking other plants as black cohosh, right? You know, okay, not great for quality control, but you could understand how that happened. Nope, that was all a plant not native to North America. So a deliberate. Yeah, a deliberate kind of adulteration. So when you get a supplement, it could be brown yeah. rice powder. It could be dirt from somebody's backyard. Um, or it could be or it could be what it claims. And you are assuming all that risk. Yeah. And, you know, supplements are multi, multi-billion dollar year industry. And sure. the fact that they don't test their products for purity, the fact that they, they're not regulated by, you know, agencies is, is a huge problem because we know, I think history has told us that, um, that capitalism will take, will take advantage of people wherever it can. Hmm. Well, before we go, I would like to ask you uh, around this time, especially kind of woman to woman, how your menopause journey has been and how that has influenced your work. Right. So it was fine. Um, now that doesn't mean that it was easy, but I, I yeah. think it was the fact that I was prepared. 
And I think that, you know, I had really significant hot flushes, like really bad hot flushes. But, you know, I also knew that, you know, for example, I didn't have any brain fog, but I also knew that it was temporary if it was going to happen. And it's not a sign of a problem. So I wasn't worried about that. And, you know, while I had a lot of irregular heavy bleeding, I wasn't worried about that because I knew it was normal and I knew what to do. I knew I was like, you know, after three to four months of really significant hot flushes, I thought, okay, this is ridiculous. And I have a super strong, a super family history of osteoporosis. That's what my mother died from. And so, you know, so I just thought, well, it's ridiculous that I'm suffering with hot flushes. And in addition, you know, for me, if I developed osteoporosis when I was 75 and had never gone on hormones, I would never have forgiven myself, right? Sure. So you have to say like, because, like what are the, the risks and the benefits that you can tolerate? Mm-hmm. And you know, the, I knew that the risk of breast cancer with hormones was incredibly low. It's not zero, but it's incredibly low. And I was willing to tolerate yeah. that risk. It's you know, same as having a glass of alcohol a day. You sure. know, I mean, you know, I'm so, so yeah. So, and I, I was also very fortunate that I was, when I, sort of started my menopause transition, I was in the best physical shape of my life. So my mm-hmm. muscles were strong. Everything was strong because I had just got divorced. And I, so I did it for the wrong reason. I was like, I'm going to get a revenge body. <laughs> I love that. Um, and so, you know, but, but the upside is, is that, you know, for three or four years, you know, really of the, the final part of my menopause transition, you know, I was doing weights, I was doing boot camp, I was running and I, yeah. you know, so that I really believe that probably had a significant impact as well because it's so good for your mood and it's so good for your overall health and it helps you sleep better. And, mm-hmm. uh, and then, you know, with the pandemic, like everybody else, I kind of, you know, fell, I think I moved like 300 steps a day for like three months kind of thing. Um, but I'm back at it and back lifting weights again. And, um, and it's, it's really amazing how, how good it makes you feel. And that would be, you know, when people always say like, what's the one thing you can do for menopause? I was like, it's weights and resistance training because that's what Mm. preserves your muscle mass. And so, you know, and that's, what's going to protect your bones and that's going to help prevent you from falling. And, you know, that's going to help help with in so it's going to help your metabolism. So there's so many ways that's going to help you that, you know, that exercise is sort of like the single thing that touches so many domains, your heart, your bones, your brain, um, you know, your immune system. Yeah. And in terms of the hormones, will you continue with them? Um, yeah. So, you know, I'm on a transdermal estrogen and oral progesterone uh, pharmaceutical preparations. And, yeah, um, you know, I still get some hot flushes now and then, definitely in the heat, especially. But, you know, I'm on sort of a low to mid dose enough to protect my bones. And I really don't see a need mm-hmm. to go higher, you know. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that given my family history, unless something changes significantly, it's unlikely mm-hmm. that I'm going to stop. Now, there's also Same. new data coming out all the time. I mean, there is, you know, might there be a better osteoporosis drug that comes out? Sure. If a better one comes out, I might think, well, mm-hmm. if the if the biggest reason I'm on hormones is to protect my bones, maybe I might switch. Um, you know, there's also a really great drug for hot flushes in the pipeline that works on um, the part of the brain that triggers hot flushes. And, mm-hmm. you know, might I think, oh, maybe I want to try that. I mean, I don't know. I think it's really important to always be open to the possibility that something better might come along. Yeah. I think some of the new data is, is really interesting looking at the link with estrogen and Alzheimer's, the link now, I mean, everyone is obviously immunity is such a buzzword and the role of estrogen with our immune system um, is, is just so fascinating. In terms of next steps for you, what is, what is left? You've, you've kind of almost covered us from cradle to grave. What, what, what's going to be your next project? Uh, the afterlife? Yeah, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't really figured it out. My, I have another book to write, so I have to figure something out. Okay. Um, and I didn't get to have, you know, this in-person book tour. So, um, sure. to sort of mine for my next book, I have an idea. I think, um, I want to sort of explore more, um, uh, how everything that we believe about, about women's bodies and women's health is actually, based on sort of all these sort of serial patriarchal lies and how they just sort of like build and build and build on each other. Um, and so, so yeah, so I kind of have a, have a sort of a book of essays in mind. Um, so we'll see, my publisher has to say that's what they want too, right? So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's really great to talk to you. Thank you so much oh, for my sharing pleasure. so much, especially at this special time as we celebrate 
womanhood and the aging of all women healthily and well. And huge good luck with everything that you're doing. It's, it's been great to chat. Thank you, Dr. Gunter. Thank you so much for having me. Well, that is it for today's episode. Hmm, interesting. What do you think? Well, huge thanks to Dr. Gunter. And as always, you will find the links and the resources that we mentioned over on lizalwellbeing.com. Do please head over there to click to find out more, particularly on the research studies that we talked about. And if you're watching this on YouTube, then you will be able to click the URL below. And also don't forget that on lizardwellbeing.com you can sign up for the free weekly newsletter that is filled with weekly tips, especially on having a happier, healthier menopause and beyond. Very many thanks to all those who have left us such lovely reviews. It really does help others to find the show and spread the word, the M word, the menopause word. Yes, let's just keep saying it. So until the next time we chat, go well. Bye-bye. The Lizelle Wellbeing Show is presented by me, Lizelle, with production by Amara Lizelle and Harry Trevithick at Heart Dialogue. With thanks to my producer, Ellie Smith, and my guest booker, Millie de la Morinière.